Okay. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Anybody watching the Olympics, by the way? You are? I'm addicted. Okay, you're addicted to the Olympics. Yes. Okay. Well, I can't watch right now, but... Yeah, well, you're going to get an Olympic talk right now, but it's mm -hmm. not the Olympic talk you think you're going to get. Mm -hmm. It's about how the Olympics on the global stage, it's a world platform and sometimes uh, murderous dictators get the better of the International Olympic Committee. Uh, my name is Evan Weiner. I didn't know either one of these guys. However, uh, over the years I have uh, been around the Olympics. Some of my best friends were part of the 1984 Los Angeles Olympics, like Shelley Saltman, who I know somewhere out there is here saying my ears are burning and he's got his burner phone trying to get a hold of me but right now we can't. Rennie Henry and some other people I knew from the Olympics from 1984 included uh, Peter Ubroth who ran the Olympics, his assistant Harry Usher, Rich Levin and uh, Harvey Schiller all uh, whom I knew uh, over the years and uh, Harvey is still around as is Rennie. Uh, the Olympics the guy on the left here is Avery Brundage, who is a racist, or was a racist, and an anti-Semite. The guy here is Judge Jeremiah Mahoney. Jeremiah Mahoney, I first became familiar with him by going to the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. Anybody have gone there to the Holocaust Museum? Well, you probably missed it. There's a little row of little, little plaques, uh, and they were the non-Jews who helped Jews prior to the Holocaust and then after the Holocaust. And Mahoney is one of the guys who was listed there. He was the guy who uh, selected the 1936 Berlin Olympics American team. Now, um, this is an unusual talk in that whoever gives you talks probably doesn't have first-hand experience in some things. 1936 was 88 years ago. And I had dealings with the three most prominent Jews who were not part of the uh, Olympics in 1936. Marty Glickman, who I worked with in 1988. Sam Stoller, who was the organizer of the Milrose Games. And a woman by the name of uh, Margaret Lambert, who uh, back in those days was known as Gretel Bergman. Gretel was her nickname, and Bergman was her maiden name. And I interviewed her in 1993. <laughs> So in terms of the 1936 Olympics, I have kind of a unique perspective on it because the three most prominent Jews who were not part of the Olympics, I had interactions with. In 1931, the, uh, yeah, aren't we supposed to be going here? Here we go. 1931, the International Olympic Committee awarded the 1936 Summer Games to Berlin. Now this goes back to 1919 and the, uh, the Treaty of Versailles uh, when the uh, powers, uh, the United States, England, France, and Italy decided to punish Germany to the point whereby... Um, Just the Olympics today? Yeah, okay. yeah. They decided to uh, punish Germany to the point where no military, no air force, you are going to be punished for World War I. Uh, but by 1931, the International Olympic Committee said, you know what, why don't we give Berlin the 1936 Games? Why don't we end the isolation and allow them to return to uh, the Olympics? Well, Nazi uh, Germany, Adolf Hitler consolidates power in 1933. He becomes the Chancellor of Germany. And he quickly turned the democracy into a one-party dictatorship which persecuted Jews, uh, as well as Romans or Gypsies, political opponents, and uh, people from the lesbian gay community as well. The Nazis' claim of controlling all aspects of German life extended to sports. Now, you remember what Hitler looked like, correct? Well, he was not what you would call a good-looking man, was he? He wasn't blonde and he didn't have blue eyes, did he? In fact, he wasn't even a German. He was an Austrian uh, who uh, gave a speech in 1920, February 24th, 1920, in Munich, which laid the foundation of Nazism. However, by 1933, the German sports imagery 
uh, served to promote the myth of the Aryan racial superiority and physical prowess in sculpture and other forms. German artists uh, idealized uh, athletes' well-developed muscle tone and heroic strength and accentuated uh, Aryan facial features. Now, uh, starting in 1933, Hitler decides we don't want any Jews around, and he expels Jews from the German Sports uh, Association. This guy's name is Eric Selig, and he was the light heavyweight boxing champion of the world. What was in his name? Eric Selig. Eric Selig. In uh, April 1933, the Aryan only policy uh, was instituted in German athletic organizations. Non Aryans, Jews, or individuals with Jewish parents or the gypsies were systematically excluded from German sports facilities and associations. The only thing that Eric Seelig uh, did wrong was that he was Jewish. Goodbye, we don't want you. Daniel Print, any tennis fans here? Nobody watches tennis? Any tennis? Well, Daniel Prenn was a member of uh, Germany's Davis Cup team, and he was one of the great tennis players in the world in 1933. But he has one thing going against him. He, too, is Jewish, so he has kicked off German's Davis Cup team, or Germany's Davis Cup team. And then uh, there's Gretel Bergman. And I'm going to get into the interview I did with Gretel Bergman in a little bit. She was a world-class high jumper. She was the best athlete, female athlete, in Western Europe. And she was expelled from her German club in 1933, yet they called her back to try out for the 1936 Berlin Olympics. She trained in London, and by 1935, she's back in Germany. This guy is Ernest Jenke. I don't expect any of you to know who Ernest Jenke was, so I'm going to tell you who he was. He was uh, the former assistant secretary to the Navy, and he was an American International Olympic Committee delegate. He's getting reports because, as a courtesy, former uh, secretary of navies or uh, assistant secretary of the Navy would get reports as a uh, courtesy. And he also had uh, family in Germany. And he begins to express outrage with reports of what is happening within Hitler's Germany. And on November 25th, 1935, he sends a letter to the International Olympic Committee President, Cap Henri Ballard Latour. Now, if you've hung around the Olympic movement the way I have over the last 40 years, you find there are a lot of counts, a lot of lords. Lord Killian ran the Olympics in the late 1970s. Uh, Lord Coe, who was running the English Sports Committee now uh, in, in England, uh, Sebastian Coe. And there are a lot of... Uh, barons and counts and a whole bunch of other people. Anyway, so he sends this letter and basically says, you know what? As Americans, we should boycott the Olympics. Neither Americans nor the representatives of other countries can take part in the games in Nazi Germany without at least acquiescing in the contempt of the Nazis for fair play and their sordid exploitation of the games. In typical International Olympic Committee fashion, the letter goes unanswered. Janke was then thrown out of the International Olympic Committee. He was a delegate, and his place was taken by Avery Brundage. December 8, 1935, Judge Jeremiah Mahoney, who's of New York or from New York, says it's time for a boycott. We cannot go to these Olympics because of what Hitler was doing. One of the things Hitler did in 1935 was basically tell the world, I don't care what you think, oh yeah, 1919 Treaty of Versailles said we couldn't militarize anymore, we're not listening to you, we formed the Luftwaffe against the world's wishes, except nobody in the world stood up to Hitler, nobody. And this is going to be another piece of not standing up to Hitler, although Mahoney tried. There is no room for discrimination on grounds of race, color, and creed in the Olympics. The AAU voted in 1933 to accept an invitation to compete at Berlin in 1936, provided Germany pledged that uh, there would be no discrimination against Jewish athletes. That pledge is not kept, 
I personally do not see why we should compete. I mean, he would go on tour in the United States uh, with uh, the New York governor, Al Smith, who was a Catholic, Mahoney was a Catholic, and along with James Curley, who was the uh, governor of Massachusetts, who was also a Catholic, and that's important in a couple of minutes, as you'll see. This is Ben Johnson, and he was part of the United States Olympic team going to Germany in 1936. Mahoney was the president of the Amateur Athletic Union. He was responsible for the selection of the athletes on the Olympic team. Ben Johnson disagreed with boycotting the Berlin Games. The Negro in the South is discriminated against as much as Jews in Germany. It is futile and hypocritical that Judge Mahoney should attempt to clean up conditions in Germany before cleaning up similar conditions in America. Franklin Roosevelt, not stopping him. He thought the diplomats should do what they do and athletes should do what they do. And he urged the American team to go to the Berlin Olympics. Now, I told you I worked with Marty Glickman for his broadcast school in 1988. And uh, if you ever saw Marty, start, do you know who Marty is, by the way? He was an announcer for the New York Knicks and New York Giants and also the New York Jets and he ran the broadcasting school, and he was a world-class athlete. Anybody here from Brooklyn? You're from Brooklyn. You're from... Forget about it. You got that attitude? Yes. You have that attitude right in the face. So did Marty. In fact, Marty's uh, autobiography was uh, Fastest Kid in Brooklyn. That was his autobiography, Fastest Kid in Brooklyn. Uh, anyway, for the first time in the history of the modern Olympic Games, people in the United States and Europe called for a boycott of the Olympics because of what would later become known as human rights abuses. Avery Brundage was a racist. Avery Brundage was an anti-Semite. And he's basically in charge now of the Olympic team. And he had assurances from Hitler, oh, it's going to be good, there weren't going to be any problems, we're not going to discriminate against Jews or anybody else, it'll be okay. Brundage says this, certain Jews must understand they cannot use these games as a weapon in their boycott against the Nazis. And uh, he labeled Mahoney's movement trying to get a, an Olympic boycott a Jewish <laughs> communist conspiracy. Mahoney is Catholic. Curley is Catholic. Al Smith is Catholic. Catholic. Yeah, they're all Catholic. Um, I don't know, Avery Brundage came of age in the 19-teens. That was the days of Wilson and the Espionage Act and Sedition Act because uh, uh, there were a lot of people running around the world who were communists, who were Jews, that were pushing an uh, agenda that was the farthest thing from capitalism. Um, some American newspapers called Avery Brundage a Nazi stooge. Too good, too nice. Should have been worse. So when uh, the American team got to the Brandenburg Gate in Berlin, this is what they saw, the swastika and the Olympic rings. Uh, in August 1936, the Nazi regime tried to camouflage its violent racist past while uh, hosting the Olympics. Most anti-Jewish signs were temporarily removed, and newspapers toned down the rhetoric. It was all an illusion. The Berlin Games presented to foreign spectators and journalists with a false image of a peaceful, tolerant Germany. Or as Mel Brooks would say, the Hitler with a song in his heart. <laughs> However, uh, about 15 years ago I did a talk, and uh, there was a guy who was about 90 years old at that point, uh, and he, uh, his parents sent him to England to live in 1933. His father was a newspaper editor who ended up in Prague. And he went to see his parents during um, the time of the 1936 Summer Olympics. And he said that um, it was okay. He said he was able to take the train, go across Germany, get into Prague, no problem. Because the Olympics were taking place and they cleaned up the image. He said when he got back, uh, or was going to go back, he's on the train, he's a dirty Jew, he's spit on, he's kicked upon, and he was really happy to get back to London. Now, I don't know what happened to his uh, family uh, in Prague, but uh, he ended up coming to the United States, 
uh, graduated Columbia University as a physicist and uh, lived up in Stanford, Connecticut. But Germany had its propaganda coup. 49 nations sent teams to the games and that legitimized the Hitler regime, uh, legitimized the Hitler regime in both the eyes of the world and in German domestic audiences. Uh, what country uh, started commercial TV regularly? Do you know? Germany. Germany had the first regularly scheduled television. Uh, and it starts on March 22nd, 1935. Begins in Berlin. It used a 180-line screen. Uh, I'm not going to get into the technical details, but the United States picture tube was different than the one in uh, Germany. And it was on three times a week for 90 minutes. Uh, the Nazis used the 1936 Olympic Games for propaganda purposes. The Nazis promoted an image of a new, strong, united Germany while masking the regime's targeting of Jews and Romans and lesbians and gays and political opponents, as well as Germany's growing militarism, even though they were not supposed to have a military, according to the terms of the 1919 Treaty of Versailles. Jesse Owens would steal the show, and that didn't make Hitler very happy, but he would steal the show. During the 1936 Summer Olympics, broadcasts uh, took place up to eight hours a day in Berlin and Hamburg, but uh, the Nazis were not able to sell TVs to make it worth its while to uh, push televisions, and uh, they ended their experiment pretty much after that. Okay, here's Marty, Marty Glickman. He's on the left, Sam Stoller on the right. Uh, I knew both, worked with Marty, and Sam was the organizer of the Milrose track and field games at Madison Square Garden, which included the Wanamaker Mile. Remember uh, the store Wanamakers? They sponsored that race. Anyway, Marty and Sam, they're on the ship that's going across the Atlantic, and they are going to Berlin. And Marty's going to win that gold medal. He's going to win that gold medal because he wants to stick that gold medal right in the Fuhrer's face. He's going to go up on the podium and he's going to show the Fuhrer that this Jew from Brooklyn isn't afraid of him at all. Well, the day before the race, the 4x100 meter relay, uh, both Sam and Marty were replaced by Jesse Owens and Ralph Metcalf, the team's two fastest sprinters. Coaches claimed they needed their fastest runners to win the race. Glickman said that the coach team Cromwell and Avery Brundage were motivated by anti-Semitism and the desire to spare the Fuhrer, the embarrassing sight of two American Jews on the winning podium, with one of them going just like that, Marty. Here's my medal. Take it, Fuhrer. Uh, Sam was a quiet guy. Marty was brash. Marty was in your face Brooklyn, and I'm sure you have been, you have witnessed in your face Brooklyn in your life. That was Marty. Sam wasn't from Brooklyn. He was from uh, New York City, but he wasn't from Brooklyn. And he was quiet, very quiet by his nature. Uh, he didn't believe anti-Semitism was involved, but he was 21 years old at the time, and he described the incident in his diary as the most humiliating episode in his life. Marty talking. We were shocked. Sam was completely stunned. Didn't say a word in the meeting. I was a brash 18-year-old kid. Fastest kid from Brooklyn, or in Brooklyn. Uh, and, he, and I said, Coach, you can't hide world-class sprinters. At which Jesse spoke up and said, Coach, I've won my three gold medals, the 100, 200, and long jump. Tired. Had it. Let Worthy and Sam run. They deserve it, said Jesse. And Cromwell pointed his finger at him and said, you'll do as you're told. In those days, black athletes did what they were told, and Jesse was quiet after that. Uh, Draper and Wyckoff stay, and uh, here is Jesse, and there is uh, Ralph Midcap. Uh, it's 1993, and the United States Olympic Committee is holding a banquet and, uh, at the New York Athletic Club for various Olympic athletes that represented the United States throughout the years. It's Gretel Bergman who never represented the United States. But here's a story. 
Um, I kind of told you the story with Gretel Berwin. Um, she goes trains in London, and they bring her back, and um, she's racing. And all of a sudden, the final race before the Olympics, she's denied a place on the team. Germany sacrificed a chance for a gold medal with this action. So we're at the um, New York Athletic Club. Marsh Schneider is with the Associated Press, me and Grillo Bergman. There were other athletes there, but there was only one athlete I really wanted to talk to, and that was Grillo Bergman. Um, so we're kind of waiting around the lobby because they have this stupid thing that you can't talk officially until we give you the go-ahead that you can talk officially, but you could have small talk. Ridiculous. Anyway, um, so we're talking, and um, I said, you know, 20 years ago, so take you back to the early 1970s, that Marv, me, and you would not be allowed in the lobby of the New York Athletic Club or the Downtown Athletic Club. And she laughed, she said, better here than Berlin. And she said, I'm never buying a Ford in my life. I'm never buying a Mercedes in my life. So uh, we get to go ahead. We get to go ahead. We can talk. Now I'm going to make all of you, me, and you know the story. I've given you the story of Gretel Bergman. What would you ask her? I had a one word question. Why? You've got to understand something. They took everything away from us. They took our homes away. They took our educational opportunities away. They took their, our jobs away. The men, Jewish men, had to put an I in their name so they were identified as Jews. We were losing hope. We were losing hope totally. But here I am, and I'm able to do whatever I'm doing. And she said, I knew I was never going to be on that Olympic team. They weren't going to let me on. But I had to give my people hope. They needed hope. You don't know how bad it was. It was getting worse and worse and worse day by day by day. She said, I was the great Jewish hope. As it turned out, she was just another Jew from Germany. In 1937, Gretel Bergman was able to obtain papers that allowed her to immigrate to the United States. She landed at Ellis Island, then New York City, up, uh, and eventually in Forest Hills, where she was sponsored, along with her boyfriend, who was another world-class athlete, Bruno Lambert. They had between them $20, which is about $440 today. That's all they had. However, they had a place to go. Uh, the $10, that's all the money that Germany allowed a individual, and I knew a couple of other individuals who left in 1937, uh, a guy named Marty Stern who lived around here. Anyway, uh, 10 bucks, that's it. That's all you can take. Goodbye, get lost. Well, she would work as a masseuse, a housemaid, and later a physical therapist. She continued to participate in sports, won the 1937 and 1938 U.S. Women's High Jump Championships, in addition to the 1937 Shot Put Championship. She married Dr. Dr. Bruno Lambert in 1938. They received citizenship in 1942, and that should be the end of the story, correct? Shouldn't hear from her ever again. However, in Israel, in the late 1970s, there were a couple of researchers, and they decided, you know what, it's worth to look back to see exactly who this woman was and what happened to her. She faded into obscurity, but the researchers did the research and said, hey, this is an interesting story. Is this woman still around? Yeah, she's still around. She's still around. She's only 66 years old in 1980. She was inducted into the uh, Jewish, Sports, uh, Jewish Hall of Fame, Wingate Institute in Israel. Uh, and then her life, she became famous again. The Olympics did something very strange for the International Olympic Committee. They did something nice. Uh, they gave her a gold medal in 1996 at the Atlanta Olympics. Why? 
because she would have won a gold medal 60 years earlier. Then there were two guys, Russ uh, Leventhal and uh, a guy named Fuchs over at HBO. And uh, they hear the story. They want to do the story about her. And she agrees, except there's a problem. They want her to go back to Germany. They said, we need you to go to Germany to complete this story. No, I'm not going back to Germany. What year is this? This is about 97, 98. 97, 98. Um, I'm not going back to Germany. They finally persuaded her in 1999 to go to Germany. Uh, she uh, went to a stadium in Lapland, Germany. The stadium was named after her. She used to train there. On uh, November 23rd, 2009, and uh, at this point she is 95 years old, her German national record from 1936 was officially restored by the German Track and Field Association, which also requested she be admitted to the German Sports Hall of Fame. She lived to see both happen. Uh, the uh, Hall of Fame was uh, in 2012. She was 97 years old. She passed away at the age of 103 in 2017. There was a Jewish woman who did compete for the Nazis. She was a member of the German team. She was a fencer by the name of Helene Mayer. Uh, German authorities allowed the star fencer, Helene Mayer, to represent Germany at the Olympic Games in Berlin. She was viewed as a non-Aryan because her father was Jewish. She won a silver medal in the women's individual fencing and like uh, all the other medalists for Germany, gave the Nazi salute on the podium. No other Jewish athlete competed for Germany in those games. Meyer ended up in California four years later, but there's very little about her. There's extremely little in terms of what her life was like, why she ended up in California. There are no film clips of her talking about the time. She never wrote a book, uh, and she would die young, only 42 years old. Uh, in 2000, Sports Illustrated, when it was a legitimate magazine, named Mayer the greatest fencer of the 20th century. Meanwhile, the games. There's Hitler. There's Jesse Owens. Adolf Hitler hoped that the 1936 Berlin Games would prove his theory of racial, area of racial superiority. Owens won four gold medals in the 100 meter, 200 meters, four by 100 meter relay where he replaced Marty Glickman, uh, and um, long jump. He set three world records. One of those world records was in the four by 100 meter relay. Now, Owens had never ran a relay race in his life. And all of a sudden he's on the team. And you have to know how to take the baton and pass off the baton. He was totally unfamiliar with it. They worked with him. You know, they could have, they could have been sabotaging their chance for a gold medal uh, with Jesse Owens in there, but he came through. Now Owens uh, basically humiliates Hitler, but he's also snubbed by Franklin Roosevelt when he came home. After all, this is Jim Crow America, and 1936 is an election year, and Roosevelt is up for re-election, and he might have some vulnerability, at least uh, he thought the year before, you, uh, Huey Long, who was a senator from Louisiana, was popular. He had a populist message, and he was assassinated, and that was the end of that. So Roosevelt's also playing the political card. Owen said, Hitler didn't snub me. It was Roosevelt who snubbed me. The president didn't even send me a telegram. Roosevelt never publicly acknowledged Owen's triumphs or the triumphs of any of the 18 African Americans who competed at the Berlin Winter, uh, Summer Olympics. Only white Olympians were invited to the White House in 1936. The relatives of Jesse Owens and 17 other African Americans who comp competed in the 1936 Olympics uh, were welcomed to the White House by Barack Obama in 2016 in celebration of their lives and accomplishments. Uh, you got to realize by this point, Marty would have been, what, 98, 99 years old, and he was one of the youngest ones um, back then. Actually, he'd be 98 years old. Why the snub? Roosevelt's running for re-election. Probably didn't want to upset members of his own party, Southern Democrats, 
who enacted Jim Crow laws after the Civil War. Off to Berlin, Marty's ready, Sam's ready, but they never raced, and they never had another Olympic opportunity. Uh, the medals, nine athletes who were Jewish or of Jewish parentage won medals in the Nazi Olympics, including uh, Mayer, five Hungarians, seven Jewish male athletes from the United States went to Berlin, and they had a lot of pressure on them from Jewish groups not to go. But as Marty told me, I was going to go get that gold medal and just stick it in the Fuhrer's face. Um, like uh, some of the uh, European Jewish competitors at the Olympics, many of these young men were pressured by Jewish organizations to boycott the game. Roman Cantor, he was one of the athletes in 1936. Many Jewish athletes who either competed in the Olympics prior to 1936 or 1936 itself uh, would die in, the con in concentration camps during the Holocaust. Among them was uh, Idzib Stradbin, a Polish swimmer, and Roman Cantor, a Polish fencer, both of whom competed in 1936 and later died at uh, Mendanic. Now, if they could find this around here, there are two great HBO specials. Gretel Bergman, Hitler's Pawn, and that tells the entire story of 1936, and one called simply Glickman, as in Marty Glickman. Uh, a lot of it about the 36 Olympics, but other things he did. Here's another guy you've never heard of. His name is Wolfgang Furstner, and he was the head of the Olympic Village, uh, the vice commander of Berlin's Olympic Village during the 36 Olympics. Uh, Furstner committed suicide with a pistol shot August 19, 1936, three days after the end of the Games. Why? He was afraid the Nazis would find out he had Jewish blood. Neville Chamberlain, 1938. Germany invades Czechoslovakia. Peaceman, let's appease Hitler, let's appease Hitler. No, peace is at hand. Well, it wasn't. 1940 Olympics, next up, Sapporo, Japan is supposed to get the Olympics, Winter Olympics. Uh, it had been selected in 1937, the same year that the Sino-Japanese War broke out. This eventually led to a change of the host city to San Moritz, which staged the games in 1928, but Switzerland said no. We need a place. We need a place. January 9, 1939 comes along, and the International Olympic Committee gives the games to Germany near the site of the 1936 Winter Games by Munich. Well, at this point, Germany had invaded Austria. It was seven months after Kristallnacht. It was less than three months after German troops invaded bits of Czechoslovakia, but hey, we need an Olympic spot. That sounds good by Munich. You have the games. It gets worse, though. The International Olympic Committee gets worse. They give the 1944 games to this guy, Benito Mussolini. Uh, and it's in Mussolini's Italy, in Cortina di Ampeza, but neither Olympics took place because of World War II. Uh, on September 1st, 1939, Germany invades Poland. That was the start of the World War II, although Adolf Hitler had been picking off countries prior to that, such as Austria and Czechoslovakia. No Olympics for Marty, no Olympics for Sam, no Olympics for Gretel. 1940 or 44. By the time the Olympics come back in 1948, Marty, who was born in uh, 1918, is 30 years old. Sam is 33, and uh, Gretel's 34. They're too old for the Olympics. But there is a guy who has an amazing story, and I'm going to tell you about. It. And if the Olympics were going back to 1948 given the TV that uh, how the Olympics are on TV with their soap opera stories. This guy, shall I leave this picture up for a minute? The women, have one woman said, can you just leave that picture up? Can you just, I just want to look at it for a while. Anyway, Alfred Nakichi, that's who that is, and he's French. 
Uh, Nakichi competed for France in the 1936 games and came in fourth as part of the 4 by 200 meter relay, missing a bronze medal by just six seconds. In 1941, he set a world record for the 200 meter breaststroke, beating the German champion along the way. He was a Jewish swimmer. He attracted criticism and was restricted from entering races, although many of France's leading swimmers also withdrew uh, in protest at Nakichi's treatment. This is the remarkable part of the story. January 1944, he, his wife, and two-year-old daughter were all arrested and deported to Auschwitz. Of the 1,368 men, women, and children who made that journey, only 47 survived. His wife and daughter died. Less than a year after the liberation of Buchenwald, where he was, 1946, he's back to being a world-class athlete, even though he was in a concentration camp for a year. Uh, he's part of the French team that set a world record in the 3 by 100 meter relay. That year, he also became the French national champion at the butterfly and the 4 by 100 meter relay. The London Games, 1948. In London, Nakichi swam in the 200 meter breaststroke, reaching the semifinals. He was also part of France's winning, polo, uh, uh, part of France's water polo team. An amazing story, yes or no? It's an amazing story. Okay, clock goes ahead to 1972. I told you I, did, I dealt with Bergman, Marty, and Sam. Well, there are a couple other people who I'm going to talk about now. Howard Cosell! We were friendly. I'm still friendly with his grandsons, Colin, Justin, who runs a charter school, Jared, who's an ESPN lawyer, and Mark Spitz. Uh, the Munich 11. Nine Israeli athletes and two coaches were killed in Munich. And this is the first time you ever saw terrorism in your living room. Um, Jim McKay is on, Jim McManus, who I almost worked with in 1995. We had a proposal together, we are going to work together. And uh, he said, you know what, I've done this long enough, I want to retire. But Jim McManus is the guy who narrated terrorism in your living room in 1972. The Day of Terror began at 4.30 in the morning, Munich time, September 5th, which was 10.30 at night in New York, when eight Palestinian militants affiliated with Black September, a militant offshoot of the Palestinian group, Fatah, scaled the fence surrounding the Olympic Village in Munich. These guys were bad guys. These guys were in Jordan in 1970, and in September of 1970, they, twi they twice tried to kill King Hussein. Hussein uh, got his army out and uh, basically crushed these militants. They fled to Syria and ended up in Lebanon, and they planned out their next attack. Disguised as athletes, using stolen keys, they forced their way into the quarters of the Israeli Olympic team. About 10 o'clock at night, September 5th, which would be 4 o'clock in the afternoon, uh, New York time, the Germans thought they had reached an agreement with the terrorists. Terrorists led their bound and blindfolded hostages from their quarters into buses that transported them to waiting helicopters. And that is Jim McKay. Anybody watch the wide world of sports with the uh, thrill of victory and the agony of defeat? Jim McMahon. It's like I said, we were supposed to work together on a project in 1995 and he said, you know what, I'm in my 60s. I've been doing this forever. I just, I just want to retire. And he did. He started out as a newspaper man with the Baltimore Sun. Um, so he's told, he's just relaxing by the pool. He's told, put on a jacket, shirt and tie. Don't worry about your swim trunks. Don't worry about what you're on your feet. You're going to go and basically you're going to report. We're going to shoot you from the waist up. How would Cosell say that it should have been me? Should have been me. Jim McManus was a fine man, a fine man. But was he ever chased by the Irish kids up Eastern Parkway? I knew prejudice. The Irish kids come in. Howard, I don't know if you know this, Howard was six foot three. Howard Cosell was six foot three. His uh, grandson Justin, six foot five. Big guys, big guys. Howard was also a Marine Staff Sergeant during World War II. And I kind of looked at him. I said, did they ever catch you? 
Of course not. <laughs> Anybody here from Brooklyn ever chased by the Irish kids down Eastern Parkway? Yeah. You were? <laughs> anyway, that was Howard's story. Uh, at 12.30, Munich time, September 6th, the shooting had stopped and the 20-hour reign of terror was over. 11 Israelis had been killed, along with one Munich policeman. Five black September terrorists lay dead. Three of the gunmen were captured. At 3 a.m., that is in Munich, at 9 o'clock in New York and in Washington, D.C., and in Washington, D.C., McKay, who had been broadcasting from the Olympic Village for 14 straight hours, summarized the tragic outcome of the Bosch rescue with the words, they're all gone. Walter Cronkite sent him a note afterwards, America's most trusted man on CBS, saying that you did our profession good. Jim McKay was that good that day telling you what was going on. German authorities never did storm building 31. They allowed the terrorists to take the hostages by helicopter to a nearby military air base. There the Germans had planned an ambush and rescue operation, but it was bungled badly. Nine Israeli hostages were killed by a combination of terrorist gunfire and a hand grenade that one of the Palestinians set off in the helicopter as it sat on the ground. And Howard's still bitching about not being the anchor. There is Howard. Uh, but he was part of it. He just wasn't anchoring it. One of the things he said, we have an immense flurry of action here. He told that to Peter Jennings. Police in platoon-like numbers are staging in front of us. Richard Nixon, remember him? Ah, uh, I knew Nixon. I think I've told you a story I knew Nixon from 1985. And uh, I'm not going to get into the story right here because that would take away from whatever. But uh, Nixon, <laughs> Nixon one day said, I said to him, good morning, how are you? And, he, and I said, good morning, Mr. President, how are you? And he looked at me and says, ah, oh, Evan, ah, oh, ah, oh, call me Dick, call me Dick. So, excuse me when I refer to him as Dick, Nick, Dick Nixon, because I used to call him Dick all the time. Anyway, most powerful man in the world? What do you think? And President of the United States, is he the most powerful man in the world? Yes or no? No. Yeah, he is. Most powerful man in the world. But Avery Brundage at the uh, International Olympic Committee isn't going to listen to Dick Nixon. Nixon and the Telegram had demanded the rest of the games be called off. Avery Brundage, the games must go on. The games must go on. The games must go on. Uh, at a memorial service on September 6th, Brundage announced that the games would continue. Uh, he had given an interview the year before and somebody asked him, you've been through all these Olympics going back to the 1920s. Um, what was the best games you ever saw? And his response, the 1936 Berlin Games was the finest ever. Brundage would be a central character in German Olympics history. Now in 1999, I went uh, to the Helmsley Palace in Manhattan <coughs> and interviewed this guy, Mark Spitz. And what you're going to get is a transcript of the interview I did with him. Uh, the Jewish-American swimmer, Mark Spitz, who had set a record of seven gold medals, was spirited out of Munich to London in fear that he would be a target of other terrorists. A news conference celebrating Spitz's achievements was hurriedly, hurriedly canceled. The swimming program had stopped, and this is the transcript. The swimming program had stopped, said Spitz. I swam all my events that evening, and the last day of competition was on Monday. This happened on Tuesday on the morning. Swimming was through, so I didn't have to compete anymore. I had a uh, press conference right afterwards on Tuesday. That is when everyone told me about this Israeli tragedy or the thing that was happening at the time hadn't turned into a major tragedy at the moment. At least at that time, they didn't know much about it. The next day, I was whisked away. Meanwhile, Brundage is giving this rah-rah talk, this pep talk, let's get the Olympics going. Uh, offered a 27-word tribute to our Israeli friends. Well, Avery, you didn't have any Israeli friends. And you would not want to be friends with any of the Israelis, nor would they want to be friends with you. Um, he was the International Olympic Committee and the IOC uh, ordered the competition to resume after a pause of 34 hours. 
Well, Howard Cosell once said Avery Brundage came of age during the time of William of Orange uh, in the Netherlands. And uh, I had just walked from his castle, complete with uh, all the stuff like the rack in the basement, uh, the dungeon, and I ran into this thing. William Van Orange, Grand Cafe, and I had to take a picture of it, send it to Cosell's grandkids, and their response was, you knew Papa, didn't you? I said, yeah, I did. Cosell said that uh, Avery Brothers came of age during the time of William of Orange. At the 1976 uh, Olympics in Montreal, the Israeli team remembered, but the IOC didn't. The team entered the stadium at the opening ceremony with a black ribbon on the national flag. The International Olympic Committee never acknowledged the massacre officially uh, and in 2010 refused to honor the slain athletes and coaches at the London Summer Olympics on the 40th anniversary of the attack. Bob Costas, who I know, uh, was anchoring the Olympics coverage and he tore apart the International Olympic Committee for uh, the lack of recognition for the 40th anniversary. And uh, he had to be, he had to. Somebody high in Comcast said, you could do it. And my assumption is, it's the guy who owns Comcast, or CEO, Brian Roberts, who is Jewish, whose family competed in the Maccabee Games in Israel in 2011. At long last, the Olympics recognized the athletes. It's the 44th anniversary. This is Thomas Bach. He's the head of the Olympic Committee, and he is hugging two of the widows. The International Olympic Committee President Thomas Bach led a morning ceremony at the 2019 Rio Games for the 11 Israeli athletes and coaches slain by Palestinian terrorists at the 1972 Munich Olympics. A tribute that one of the widows of the victims uh, said brought closure for the families. And he is signing an official uh, decree uh, in uh, Rio de Janeiro at the uh, winter, at Summer Games in Rio 2016. But there was a string attached. There was a string attached. See, he didn't want to just honor the 11 Israeli athletes because that might cause problems with others. So instead, there was one guy who was killed during the 2010 Vancouver Winter Games. Uh, he participated in luge, which is basically a sled going through a you know, track, and he had a control and he got killed. His name was Nodar Kamarita Shivili, and uh, he was killed, and he was one of the 12 that was honored. And this is Munich in uh, 2022, 50th anniversary of the Munich Olympics. The German president, Frank Walter Steinmeier, and the Israeli president, Isaac Herzog, attended a wreath laying ceremony to commemorate the victims of the attack by the Palestinian militants at the 1972 Munich Olympics on September 5th, 2022. In the summer of 2022, Germany agreed to give 28 million Euro, euros, about $25 million, uh, to the families of the murdered Israeli athletes. As head of this country and on behalf of the Federal Republic of Germany, I ask your forgiveness. President Frank Walter Steinmeier, Germany said, addressing the victims' families. Uh, it was billed as the Happy Olympics back in 1972. The Munich Games, that was going to be the first uh, Olympics to be televised worldwide. Uh, and West Germany and Munich decided, we want to get rid of that image of the Nazis. We want to forget about the Nazis. Yeah, it's in our history, but we, we really don't want to uh, talk about uh, what happened. Because in 1936, uh, in Berlin, the Olympics, the Games, they were used for a platform for Hitler's propaganda. Uh, it would become a different platform in Munich. There was finally some closure for the families. And uh, this is uh, the uh, ceremony uh, in 2022. Germany has never held another Olympics. There was a thought that Munich would host the 2024 Summer Games, but that bid failed. Uh, Alfred Horman had an interesting phrase describing the research in landing in Olympics. He didn't want a second Munich, but he wasn't referring to the massacre. He was referring to something else. Germany once put Munich up as a bidder for the Olympics, and the locals in Bavaria said, we're not paying for it. And that was that. 
Uh, and also, the Munich 2024 Summer Olympics bid was pulled after local opposition. Paris got the 2024 games unopposed. Uh, one th note about Paris this year. Um, there was supposed to be a, a ceremony, a public ceremony, July 24th, commemorating the Israeli athletes who were murdered. Uh, they did have the ceremony, but it took place indoors. The Olympic organizers and French security were afraid if they did the uh, public commemoration of the uh, Munich uh, 11, 1972, there might be a terrorist attack considering the war between Hamas and Israel. And then there was also problems with Russia and Ukraine, and there were problems in South Sudan. Paris did get the uh, 2024 games unopposed. So let me ask you a question in closing here. Should Berlin get the 2036 Olympics, which would be the 100th anniversary of the Hitler Olympics? What do you think? Should Berlin get the 2036 Olympics? Yes or no? No. No. Germany is wrestling with the notion the country should bid for the 2036 Summer Olympics and celebrate the 100th anniversary of Germany hosting what is now known as the Hitler Games. Uh, in 2019, Berlin's interior minister, Andreas Geisel, floated the notion uh, with the thought that it would be a good opportunity to show how the event was used for propaganda purposes. Germany's interior minister, Horst Seifert, threw cold water on the notion, and there is uh, of course. Uh, it would be unthinkable if we did that. We would bring an unspeakable international discussion and harm the Olympic idea. How would people see it across the world? Germany celebrating the 100th year anniversary of the Nazi Olympics? That cannot happen. People in Berlin, like the mayor of Berlin, continue to push for a 2036 Summer Olympics bid. And uh, well, I guess they can revisit this. This is the torch relay going through Berlin. And these are all the Nazi soldiers there and other people there the torch relay in 1936. 1936 Olympics established a rah-rah national patriotism now seen in today's games. But the media seemed to miss a story in 1936, and they're missing a story this year in Paris. The media basically didn't look around. What's going around in Germany? Uh, Time magazine reported that most newspapers focused on the ceremonious procession of the Olympics' first modern torch relay rather than other doings in Berlin. And in 2024, there are other doings in Paris. And the media is not paying any attention to it. They're just paying attention to the games. Any questions? Any comments? Yes? Uh, a few things. Yeah. Uh, wasn't it Nietzsche 